I need somebody to sell me a car. It's going to take me across the country. A car that will take you across the country. Well, I have the Seven, car for you. 7,000 miles. You get the car for me? 7,000 miles. I've got uh, an 85 Oldsmobile for you. Yeah? It's already registered and on the road and ready to go. All right. Can you show it to me? <laughs> sure. Great. Under the hood, you've got a classic American V6, 3.8 liter GM motor. And it should be all set and ready to make this trek cross country. This takes a little bit of muscle. So you think it'll get me to California? I sure hope so. <laughs> I needed a production manager to help me drive across the country and make my film. On the internet, I found an eager Kerouac fan who agreed to do the job just for the fun of it. We had never met. Hey, Marie. Come on in. Were you here before? Because I was here, I was here about 15 minutes ago. I was dead asleep. I just woke up. Okay, okay, okay. The moment that I hung up the phone with you, yeah. and I said, oh, I can go, I can return the video, I can do this, I can do that, right. I just woke up five minutes ago. Yeah, she's the bodhisattva. Aha, uh -huh. the guru. The guru, yes. Yes. She sleeps with me. Great. Now, this is a car to go on the road with. This really yeah. does it. I got in an accident the first day I went to take my driver's license. I hit a car in the parking lot. I looked over at the inspector and I said, I guess I've blown it, huh? He says, just drive it back into the lane. <laughs> I haven't driven. Uh-oh, wait a minute. Uh, no, no, that's when You're I was... about to drive 7,000 <laughs> miles across the country. You said you could drive. I can now. You can now? What, it was up this moment? Yes, yes. It's surprising okay. when you take the, the LSD and the mushrooms and the cocaine and the alcohol out of your system, what a better driver you become. I sure loved reading the beats, and I rode the rails, walked the tracks, drank the wine, smoked the pot, um, dropped the acid, but I was never considered a hippie. I did not consider myself a hippie. I considered myself a bee. On the road, it was like a whole new experience for me. I really felt uh, a great freedom after I read it. And I felt this was one book that was really talking to me because I was always in the visualization and traveling and in motion. And when you're in motion, you're alive. So when you stop being in motion, it's the time to worry. Jack was never a hippie. Jack was as American as apple pie, you know. A Catholic or a liberal sports guy he certainly was vital and he certainly was you know he created a generation in, in a very short time and he and he brought poetry what we know today to its success and, and, it, and it's had a lot of success because of Jack Kerouac a lot of success I don't think it would have ever happened if he hadn't written on the road Jack really understood the spirituality of the beat generation, you know, the people. They were weaned on a kind of collective mistrust of uh, the authoritative manipulation, the H-bomb. And their brothers and their sisters and their fathers and their husbands would arrive dead at the end of a telegram and the war and the Cold War. Kerouac 
came out of that. That's how on the road. That was the origin of on the road. That was a reaction, you know, a social, psychological, spiritual reaction to all the things that happened in the 40s. And Jack understood that, that freedom. On the Road is a true story, the tale of Jack Kerouac and Neil Cassidy crossing America in the late 1940s, looking for Neil's lost hobo father. Neil Cassidy was a new kind of American literary hero, a restless ex-con intellectual and writer. He was a mentor and an inspiration to the beats, the fastest man alive in talk, in love, and behind the wheel of a car. I think Jack really captured my dad well in On the Road. Just a couple glimpses, you know, were breathtaking of, of how close he had him. A lot of the stuff he wrote based on, like, for example, how my father talked. I mean, the difference between town and the city and On the Road is, is him meeting Neil, you know? The prose and the stream of consciousness stuff and everything was, was right out of how Neil would talk. And not only in the car, I mean, just his continual energy. Of course, he set the downhill speed record for um, Lombard Street in the city in reverse. The speed limit's like 25 or 30. And he saw Roy coming the other way, and Roy passed and waved. And so Neil stops him somehow and slams it into reverse and floors it in reverse and catches up with Roy doing about 30 in reverse. And Roy couldn't believe it. He looks over and here's Neil next to him in the window with his arm out just chatting like this, looking over his shoulder once in a while for oncoming traffic. Jack was a fabulous, fantastic, charismatic personality himself, but he wasn't like, like Neil Cassidy. The person who played Dean Moriarty in the book, when in reality, anybody reading on the road or knowing Jack, either way, would realize that he was Sal Paradise or Jack Kerouac, the person who was there with all of these wild people. But he was the shy, more introspective, studious, adventuresome person that was along on the ride. When I began to play at the Five Spot in uh, 1957, Jack used to come down all the time. On the Road hadn't been published, so he wasn't a famous person. But his sitting there and listening, the way he would listen, you could feel it psychically. There was someone who really appreciated the music. And musicians were crazy about Jack. He was such a tremendous reader and so captivating. And then he would also sing with us sometimes. He was a terrific jazz singer. I was the first journalist, first print journalist, to take the Beat Generation seriously, because this was at a time when everybody was calling them Beatniks. When truck drivers would see a guy walking down the street with a beard, he'd holler, hey, Beatnik! I thought it was a literary movement. And so I took them seriously, and I wrote about them seriously. He talked about everything. He talked about uh, his career. He talked about, he said, hey, they're going to write biographies about me, ain't they? And he was quite proud of his accomplishment back then. I guess it all began when I was a graduate student at the University of Illinois in Chicago in 1972. And my uh, office mate, who was a hip young kid from Harvard, said, you know, man, you're nowhere because you haven't read Jack Kerouac. So I decided, OK, I'll go out and I'll read Kerouac just to show this guy that I've read him. <clears throat> and I found uh, the Dharma Bums and On the Road were the only two books that were in print. And so I picked up the Dharma Bums just to be a little different because On the Road was the famous one. And it was really the first five pages of that book that uh, blew me away and I guess has changed my life ever since. And it was because of the, the scene, which was so striking, uh, Jack Kerouac riding this boxcar up from uh, Los Angeles to Santa Barbara with a little bum and the, the bum gives him a, a prayer by St. Teresa and, and Jack goes down to the beach and he cooks some hot dogs and, and then he looks up in, in the stars, he's just read this prayer and then he sees the stars up there and it's like, why are they up there and who are they and why am I down here and who am I? On the Roof of America by Jack Kerouac from On the Road. 
At night, in this part of the West, the stars as I had seen them in Wyoming are as big as Roman candles and as lonely as the Prince of Dharma, who's lost his ancestral grove and journeys across the spaces between points in the handle of the Big Dipper, trying to find it again. So they slowly wheeled the night, and then, long before actual sunrise, the great red light appeared far over the dun bleak land towards West Kansas, and the birds took up their trill above Denver. I wondered what the spirit of the mountain was thinking, and I looked up and saw jack pines in the moon. We were on the roof of America, and all we could do was yell, I guess. Across the night, eastward over the plains, we're somewhere, somewhere an old man with white hair was probably walking towards us with the word and would arrive any moment to make us silent. Crutches. Yeah, 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 yeah. My God, look at you. Good to see hey, you. Hey, man. Good to see you. All right, how you been? Okay, how about yourself? <laughs> okay. While researching his Kerouac biography, Gerald Nicosia located Paul Blake, Jack's nephew, who was living homeless in Northern California. Well, I've been worried about, you know, Jack's works for years because things kept getting sold off and... <laughs> Well, it wasn't, uh, I told these fellas that, that you knew Jack probably as well as anybody in the world because you grew up with him. Oh, yeah, he was, he was with us all, my whole childhood, you know, I mean, off and on, he was, he was there. He was, he was a great uncle. To me, I mean, he was like a big, a big brother more than an uncle. He was... <laughs> He was always there for me. He always, you know, wanted to play basketball or football or whatever, practice a little bit, and he was just a wonderful man as far as, you know, a man goes, but he was very talented also with his writings. In the 1960 edition of his novel, Lonesome Traveler, Jack Kerouac claimed he had no children. The truth was, in 1953, Kerouac's second wife, Joan Haverty, gave birth to a daughter, Janet Michelle Kerouac. Jack hit the road before Jan's birth, and when he returned, moved in with his mother, Meme. It was Meme's decision. She'd made it plain, especially to my mother, um, that nothing was to be mentioned about about Jan, possibly being Jack's daughter. The only picture that I got to see of her before my adulthood was a picture of her when she was about three years old on a tricycle. Jack showed me this at his desk, his roll-top desk in Orlando, Florida. He said, this is my daughter. This is your cousin, Jan. What look for Cece? Cece? Cece is shot Chris. You're looking for Chris, huh? Yeah. The poet who didn't know it. Yeah. He's out on the ride right now. Yeah. Hold your horses, will ya? Give me a minute. Hey, who to the van? I guess you guys are going around doing some work about uh, about uh, Jack Kerouac. Actually, Jan. And Jan. The focus of it is Jan. Yes. Oh, that's beautiful. So, uh, I, Buddha told me you guys were, were around and that you guys were going to be doing this, and he knew that I wrote portrait poetry. And here goes the horse. Have a seat. We're going to take a short walk. This is my trained horse here. <laughs> okay, Jan Kerouac in the key of listen. And the shadow lives real as the life of 
someone great is to be the subject now that moves the sun's eclipsing. This is when she scans the sky and aligns with its will to be heard. While the, mind, while the blinded mortals listen to this real moment and this is a real glimpse of her through her dying wish. I've never been to the grave alone, ever. I was here once in 88, and there were so many people trying to take pictures of me looking at Jack's grave that I just ran off and didn't come back. Well, the first time I ever met him, I was nine, and it was in Brooklyn, and the whole purpose of the thing was for a blood test because my mother was taking him to court for child support which lots of mothers do nowadays with absentee fathers. And uh, so we were walking down the street in Brooklyn and I saw him, I saw him approach and I said, there he is, that's him. You know, and I thought that I was supposed to pick him out like from a lineup or something, you know, that I, it was my job to point him out. That's my father. What was your relationship like with him when you became a writer yourself? And, and you were an adult, did you, did you keep in touch with him? Or? Well, dead already. the problem is I only met him twice because of the circumstances. I mean, I, I was very poor. I, I lived with my mother in the Lower East Side and we were on welfare my whole life, my whole life with her, for sure. I mean, we're talking poor, okay? And yeah, and while she's scraping poor, Jack was, you know, Partying, you know, going to Big Sur, and all this happy horse shit. You know, she was like just one step away from destitute. That's one of the reasons she started hanging in the streets. You know, she had no real life. She had no father, no father image. You know, she met her father the first time when they had the blood tests. Okay, and the other day she gets on the subway, you know, bus subway with her mom, and they go to the doctor, and then you know they go back to her house. And Jack wants a drink, so, oh, I know it was a liquor store. So the two of them walk hand in hand. She was with her dad for the first time. And they went to the liquor store to buy some Harvey Bristol cream. They went back to the house, and she, he promised, I'll see you in January. That's how he pronounced it. It's in a, it's in a book, uh, both her books, actually. Yeah, you know, I'll see you in January, but January never came. This is Jan Kerouac's first book, Baby Driver. And she autographed it to me at the Beat Conference to my good friend Buddha, Love Jan Kerouac, May 18th, 94, New York City, NYC. The next book, Train Song. And she autographs it to Giovanni with Love Giovanna. These are precious. <laughs> Rain or snow, winter or summer, there's there's people coming to pay tribute to say thank you, Jack. Thank you to the father we never had, the father we never found. The father one of the I never had. Yeah. Somebody left <laughs> but some guy actually left that once. At the end of that's the end of On the Road. And they were looking for Dean's father and said to the, to the father we never found. It's kind of interesting, isn't it, that he wrote that in On the Road about Dean Moriarty, that he's yeah. the father we yeah. never found and then he became the Oh, father. there's so many fathers that so many people never find. I suppose, yeah. It's kind of it's yeah, been going true. on all through human history. Yeah. When I first met Jan Kerouac, she was working on the novel Baby Driver, which was her first novel. I read through the whole thing and I, and I loved the scenes and I thought, you know, again, she just made this whole experience come to life of what she had gone through, um, the difficult lifestyle, the, the drugs and, and uh, you know, prostitution and all the, the pains and sorrows of her life. But the, the mysterious thing was that even though these were terrible experiences, it was like the emotions were gone. She had stuffed them down so far as a kid. She had to, to survive on the streets, to survive the, the horrible loss of her father. She had to just, uh, you know, develop a very thick skin where she wasn't allowing herself to feel.
I met that girl uh, in um, about 1966 or 60, may have been 67. It was a scene. There were a lot of people and there was a lot of stuff going on. And uh, another girl, and it was only after she was gone, I think, that somebody mentioned, you know, like, oh, you know who that was? You know, I said, no, who was that? Oh, it's Jan Kerouac, you know. So, oh, yeah, really? Geez, you could have fooled me. What was Jan like? Well, she was like, uh, you know, kind of a wild girl. In fact, she was a wild girl. She was, um, I mean, I have to say it. I mean, she was promiscuous. I mean, she would, uh, you know, entertain, I guess, any young man that <laughs> took her fancy. Uh, and uh, she didn't uh, hold back. Hey, Marie. Uh, hey, Marie. Yes? Oh. This, is, uh, this, is, this is Nico Smith, and uh, he knew Jan Kerouac. Yeah. Well, hello. This is Hi, Marie Countryman. How, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good you knew Jan. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. She came by my place uh, a few times. I have a friend that's like was very close to her at that oh, time. That's why really? she came over. Yeah, she would came with him, you know. And I was introduced several times, but uh, I didn't get close to her myself. You know, uh, although it was rumored that everyone got close to her. They have his number at home, but I don't want to walk home and get it. I just go to information and try to get it his number and then I'll give it to you and then you can carry on from there all right but do you need a pen to write it down no I have cool okay I'll be right back we were kind of uh, the bridge and the tunnel crowd of the time and we'd come into Washington Square Park to just uh, hang out and we were interested in art and uh, there was this beautiful this girl and she was so lovely she was nine years old but she was really pre like precocious, this black hair, this f skin that was so fair, just these kind of beautiful dimples or apple cheeks that were, she's just such a beautiful thing. Like she would walk like a, like diaphanous um, spirit, you know, and boy, I, I was just entranced. When uh, she was about um, 13, uh, for some um, I reasoned her other. She was, uh, I mean, she was sleeping with Guy when she was about like 10. Uh, so I was not the first, but um, we started just, just making out in Washington Square Park. And she was, you know, the turned on. And we would, you know, then we'd, we'd go into her um, room. It was on the east side. I think it was on 8th Street or it could be 7th Street. I'm not sure. And uh, we would like, you know, like screw right there. She was like, 13, and I was, um, by that point, 16, I think. Her um, mom kind of, I guess, liked me. Maybe I looked like her father. <laughs> I, I wasn't quite sure exactly, but I, in, in the end, though, that was the kiss of, uh, like, death, because I think the fact that her, her mom <laughs> actually liked me was not, it was the thing that eventually drove us apart. She really wanted a guy who her mother hated. You know, that's, that was her concern. I was kind of hurt because I was really, I really like, cared for her. I forget what the deal was, whether it was some kind of anniversary deal or something, but it was pretty early on, 72, at least for me. And uh, this beautiful girl was across the room and she was like signing books or doing something. I'm not sure if her book was out yet, but uh, Baby Driver, I guess, was her first one. But I was staring at her across the room. I thought she was a knockout. You know, she had the long black hair and those eyes were killer. And so I finally got my nerve up or was introduced, I guess. Somebody introduced us. And they said, this is Jan Kerouac, Jack's daughter. And I went, whoa. And so what I blurted out was uh, I proposed, you know. I asked her to marry me. I thought it'd be perfect. I mean, think of the, I mean, you know, talk about, let's go on the road. Here's, here's Jack's daughter and Neil's son. I thought it was, I thought she'd, you know, agree in a moment. Well, she didn't get it, I guess, or she didn't think it was that historical. She kind of, she kind of blew me off. She was on her way to South America or something, you know, she was in the midst of her adventures. And um, I don't remember her exact response, but, you know, I think she was kind of like, you know, yeah, yeah, right, you know, or thanks, but no thanks type of deal. I was crushed. I don't think I was serious, of course, but I thought, geez, historically speaking, you know, we had to. I mean, it was a, not a mission from God here. 
She always picked the wrong guy. She has a history of picking the wrong guy. And she has a history of, you know, of all the drugs she took, or all the wrong drugs she took. She, because she was Jack Kerouac's daughter, and she had this, this, when you have a father like that, you have son, you, 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 it drives you crazy. Trying to live up to being a daughter, the, uh, the Jack Kerouac's daughter. She tried, you know, she tried to equal him in his, her literary uh, efforts, which she, nobody can do, and she certainly couldn't. But she tried, and you gotta give her credit for trying. She tried hard, and she, she her writings certainly are creditable, even if they're not as great as her father's. And nobody, nobody knows what's going to happen to anybody besides the forlorn rags of growing old. I think of Dean Moriarty. I even think of old Dean Moriarty, the father we never found. I think of Dean Moriarty. Dean Moriarty. I remember hearing about how when I was in the womb and he was writing on the road, my mother and he had this big problem about it because he suggested to her that she go get an abortion. And she said, no way, because she, her big thing was that she wanted kids, and, and me in particular at that point. And he said, oh, no, no, no. I can't, can't have the responsibility of uh, a kid right now because I got to finish this book, this book, this book. You know, really uh, obsessed with the book, uh, which is understandable. In fact, I myself have been in the same situation before, writing my books, the two books that I wrote, and being pregnant myself and saying to myself, oh no, I can't be pregnant now, I gotta write this book. You know, so, and at that moment when I first felt that, I thought, well, that was how he felt. I, I understand that. And I understand that he was all over the place traveling and, and there are many reasons why he didn't acknowledge me. But at the very end, he did acknowledge me. And he said, yeah, yeah, you go to Mexico, write a book, you can use my name. Jack always felt very bad because he wanted to have a family, he wanted to settle down, he wanted to be with someone. And when he got suddenly famous in the fall of 1957, his whole world kind of blew apart, coming from someone who had written 11 books and only had one published that was pretty much ignored, he suddenly became a worldwide famous person, acknowledged as the leader of the Beat Generation. I don't think he was comfortable with people, much less family, you know, wives, children. I think he wanted those things, and I'm just, it's pure conjecture from my perspective, but I think he wanted those things, but didn't really have the uh, horsepower to see it through. You know, he had a lot of dreams that I don't think he ever really fulfilled. He just liked to pine about not doing it and write about it as, as like, you know, inspiration for others. In 1966, Kerouac married his third wife, Stella Sampas. Stella ultimately inherited Jack's entire literary and personal estate and passed it on to her brother, John Sampas, when she died in 1993. Sampas family, of course, knew Jack when he was a kid. They all still love him and care about him. And it was, of course, Sebastian Sampas who inspired Jack to be a writer. He died during World War II when he was out at sea. But he was a young poet that gave Jack the thought that maybe he could be a writer. And to see John Sampas, who was suddenly inherited this whole extraordinary wealth of material of Jack. And for the first time, Jack had someone to look after his legacy. The archive is private property. We've taken care of it for 20 or 30 years. and It wasn't touched. Nothing was done. Everything was moribund. And so when I came into control of it, I said, you know, the law of unpublished Kerouac material here. We've got to get it published. And Stella had said, after I die, I want you all to take care of this. Get it out there. This is not about John Sampas 
are the Sanders family. This is about Jack Kerouac. This is, we, I'm a catalyst, I'm a, a, you know, for Jack, because Jack is dead. I didn't do any of the writing. I didn't do any of the work. I didn't do any of the creative, uh, the creativeness of this genius. Jack did all on it. I just, I'm a survivor and I'm putting the things out there, that's all. Stella Sampas believed her entire life that one day she would marry Jack Kerouac. She was middle-aged when they married, and by this time, Jack was a far-gone alcoholic, living with his bedridden mother in a small house in St. Petersburg, Florida. It wasn't pleasant for Stella. Stella was a martyr. She suffered an awful lot. He insulted her. He abused her, verbally abused her. Uh, she did a heroic job of taking care of him and his mother, but it was a mistake. It was a mistake for both of them. You don't marry somebody to take care of your paralyzed, sick mother. Jack couldn't stand her anymore because she was a small-town girl. Jack had been all around the world. Jack had this great mind, and she had this little mind, and she was trying to... She was a caretaker wife. I, you know, I've had many, much experience, many experiences with caretaker wives in which uh, the, the genius in his declining years thinks about genius things and she says, no, keep your thoughts small like mine. My first book is called Mad Man on the Merrimack and nobody's buying this, so I keep all my extra copies under my bed. That's the name, Mad Man Under My Bed. Saint Stella. You bore the weight of your beatnik burnout lifelong mate. Then in a human cause like no other, you took the task of caring for his mother. John, her brother, now holds the flame and fends off the attacks to her name. Can a brother's love keep her name defended well past the time a life has ended? St. Stella, grant me this wish to see that someone publishes this. The people that really impressed me uh, and were Kerouac's people, or the people who came from the gas stations, garages, mental institutions, left college, were told they were failures, left their homes with the consent of parole officers and probation officers who had given up on them, and guys who were writing words on toilet paper. And these were Kerouac's people. They were really uh, essentially a spiritual generation. I will not bow down. I will not bow down, America. I will not bow down to your government, to your religion. I will not bow down, America, to your materialism, to your international corporations, to your religious shrines, your stock markets, your shopping malls. I will not bow down, America, to your coal mines, to your power plants. I will not go crawling down the deep shafts at midnight. I will not bow down, America, to your invasion of privacy, to your moral absolutes, your religious political might. I will not bow down, America, to your assassins, the CIA, the FBI, the corporate police state, your killing, murdering machines. I will not bow down, America, to your bureaucracies, to your schools, to your attempt to make me the model citizen of your state, of your church. I will not bow down, America, to your history of lies, to your secrets in the best interest of to protect the people. America, I pledge allegiance to those who were here before you, to those who will be here after you are gone. America, I pledge allegiance to the Holy Spirit, to the word and to silence. I pledge allegiance to dreams, to birth, to the journey, and to death. I pledge allegiance to candor, to sincerity, to laughter, to irony, to passion, to compassion, to empathy, and to helping those in need. I pledge allegiance to resurrection of the heart. No, America, I will not bow down. I hear voices. You got it. Brown Whitehead. Hello, Jack Shea. Jack Shea. My pleasure. Nice to meet you, man. Good to meet you, finally. Ron Whitehead's ah. daughter and granddaughter. Brilliant. <laughs> Lovely. What's, what's her name? Roslyn. 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 Oh, Roslyn. And my daughter's name is Ronnie, and it's spelled R-A-N-I, and it means Hindu princess or queen. 
Right. She's a poet. <laughs> She's a poet too. This photo is uh, by Chris Felver, and this uh, was taken by Chris at Jack's uh, grave in Lowell, Massachusetts. I mean, she's the real thing, obviously. She's Kerouac's daughter, but she's uh, so similar to Kerouac in, in so many soulful ways. I mean, she was a ghost, uh, a spirit, a lost on America's highway. All right. What this is is a passenger. And she, the thing I like about her is this was an accident of design is I put her on this piece of uh, spring stainless steel just because it was just laying around but watch what happens if you're in a, on a typical road and you're riding along she's constantly doing this hey want to pull over and give me a blowjob oh hey want to get it on here at the next uh, park yeah okay are you a stupid bitch she has <laughs> She always agrees with me, no matter what I say to her. <laughs> oh, and wait, oh, let me show you this. Sunglasses are great. Now, if you get in a rough neighborhood, put this guy. <laughs> and even mean son of a bitch, just look over and see that guy sitting there, and they say, well, so much for road rage. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to try to tangle with the, I don't know who this buddy is there, but he looks bad, really bad. <laughs> The more I think about it, the whole thing of on the road and all the rest of it is just a, a big con. And that Jack was a, a skirt-grabbing mama's boy weirdo drunkard of the weirdest sort is not even slightly surprising. And I don't think it, it destroys his, his art because maybe he's the ultimate art of, artist. If he was really like that, it would have been easy to write all that stuff down. But when, in your heart, you're really a, a wuss of some sort, a version of a wuss, a strange one albeit, but nonetheless, ultimately a wuss sitting at home saying, Mom, we're out of toothpaste. Shut up! Uh, you know, how ironic. As a young guy, I had this idea of a Kerouac and a flannel shirt and a, uh, the Moriarty type scene, let's, let's go nuts, let's do everything. But yet, maybe a really funny scene w would have been him calling home. But, but mom, I know mom, I, you know, you know, all right, I'll say this one. I love you, I love you, I love you, mommy. I used to see Jack in the Bowery and eat bars, and at this time he seemed to be drowning. Whether it was from his career, as you know, was changing, he, and he wasn't writing, and he was doing very few readings. I caught him in a couple, of the last ones he did, but it just something was, you know, he was missing something. He wasn't showing up. He was out of the scene. And if he was seen, he was seen at the, some of the bars in the Bowery by himself, just drinking in slow, measured sips. Probably wondering if he was ever going to come out of it. I don't know. Jan at 15, hippie, pregnant, hitchhiking to Mexico where the babe would be stillborn. She visited her father, Jack, found him holed up in a road that led from bedroom to bar, bar to jail, jail to rooms of bedridden meme mother and raging Stella wife. Jan came to see the father of her road, found him fat, slack and slunk, inches in front of black and white TV, munching tuna from tin cans, sipping Jim Beam bottle, dull and dreary road of near death. started bleeding about 10.30 in the morning on October 20th. 
there's record from Stella and from other people that basically he was sleepless that whole night. He was out looking at the stars, he was watching TV, he was in talking with Mimer. And apparently some point between midnight and 10.30 in the morning, he typed this letter to Paul Blake Jr. dated it October 20th, 1969. I was stationed in Alaska and I was in the Air Force at the time and I received this letter. Jack was very upset with Stella Sampas and the Sampas family at the time and that he had wanted to leave everything his works, his wealth, whatever he had at that point in time to me. Two days later, I heard on the radio that my uncle had died of a massive hemorrhage and I immediately was alarmed. The uh, letter is the last letter written by Jack Kerouac before he died. My dear little Paul, this is Uncle Jack. I've turned over my entire estate, real, personal, and mixed, to Mamere. And if she dies before me, it is then going to you. And if I die thereafter, it all goes to you. I just wanted to leave my estate, which is what it really is, to someone directly connected with the last remaining drop of my direct bloodline and not to leave a ding-blasted fucking goddamn thing to my wife's 100 Greek relatives. Yeah. <laughs> I also plan to divorce or have her marriage to me annulled. They probably had a fight, and he got pissed off, and uh, he wrote a letter, if it, indeed he did write the letter. I don't know that he did, but I read that October letter, I'm very suspicious of it. If you look at the, uh, the handwriting, it was typed, but there's so many details as if it was intentionally typed with all these details to make it sound that whoever wrote the letter knew Jack's life very well. I want you to know if you're a crazy nut, you can do anything you want with my property. If I kick the bucket, because we're the same blood and we're also good buddies and have had an association that went back to when you were one year old, if you recall. Mamir is still saying, the last letter I wrote you, I asked for a reply, and you still haven't replied. I love you. I'm lonely. I'd like to see you because it makes me renew the instincts I had with your mom. Jack and Mamir. I think what happened on that October 20th letter, I know that Jack had called my brother Tony, and they argued on the phone about something. I don't know specifically what. It was very close. Something must have happened. But in any case, it doesn't matter. In his will, Jack left his entire estate to his mother, Gabrielle. Almost completely paralyzed by stroke, Gabrielle could barely walk or move her hands. For the next three years, Stella continued to feed her, clothe her, and manage her affairs. When Gabrielle died in 1972, she left everything she owned, including Jack Kerouac's entire literary estate, to Stella Sampas. Paul Blake was not informed of his grandmother's death, and he claims that for months he continued to send her small checks, all of which were cashed and signed. For one entire year, I would try and call Mame, and every time Stella would say she was either too ill or she couldn't make it to the phone, and I'd say, well, can't you take the phone to her? Why don't you have a phone in her room? <laughs> she used to tell me, well, I'm sorry, we're not able to do that. And I know now that there were times that I had called to talk to Mame that she had been passed away for some time. Well, you, you asked uh, Stella about uh, was there, when you did finally find out uh, about your grandmother's death, if there was a will, is that right? Oh yeah, I, I did. Um, 
I asked her if my grandmother had left me anything. And she said, no. Your grandmother left everything to me. And I said, well, explain this. She didn't even leave any family photos, no pictures, anything. She said, no, Paul. She left everything to me and hung up. And I decided, well, instead of going to the beach, we'll just go visit Stella. So we took off in my old car and went to St. Pete, and I pulled up in the driveway of my uncle's first house, knocked on the door. Stella came to the door, opened it up, and she says, oh my God, it's you, Paul. And she raises her cane that she's using to walk with and flipping it at me and my son. You have to leave. You have to leave. You have no right to be here. You have no right to be here. I said, I just came here to talk to you, Stella, about Mime. I said, but I sure don't understand your behavior. She says, go on, just get the hell out of here. Don't you ever come back. So that's exactly what my son and I did. The Kerouac estate has been valued at $20 million. In 1987, Jan began receiving royalties of between $40,000 and $125,000 a year due to changes in U.S. laws of inheritance. But in 1993, she learned from Gerald Nicosia that John Sampas had been selling manuscripts and letters from the Kerouac estate to private collectors. It's just John, basically. And I've even had a run-in with John down in St. Petersburg at the, at the actual house which, uh, where Jack died, which uh, he showed me the, uh, the room where there was a, the, a desk, not the roll-top desk, but another desk. But I sat there, and I had this really wonderful feeling. It was a very spiritual feeling when I sat at the, at the chair. She felt that her father's voice was speaking to her at that point and saying, you must preserve these things. These things belong to you, and, and, and it's your job, your responsibility to save them, to preserve them. She claimed she literally heard her father's voice saying that. At the end of the visit, John Sampas said, can I get you anything else? And Jan, who, of course, you know, had a sense of humor, said to him, yes, I'd like the desk. And he was stunned, according to Jan, uh, and lost at a loss for words. And then finally he said, no, you can't have it. That's the way the cookie crumbles. Twenty years after Gabrielle Kerouac's death, Gerald Nicosia obtained a copy of her will and showed it to Jan at his home in the presence of California lawyer Thomas Brill. Jan decided the signature on the will was a forgery. She took her case to court without personally informing the Sampas family and using Brill as her representative in the affair. figures in a few years maybe he'll be dead and he won't have to worry about you. Sure. You know? Well, it's so blaringly obvious that he just wants to have the money as long as he can. Money, 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 money. I'm trying to stop them. It's, very, it's all very simple. I'm just trying to keep his unpublished manuscripts and his shoes and his underwear and his raincoats and his uh, desks and the roll manuscripts of On the Road, all the things that comprise his estate, which, by the way, he left to his dear mother, Gabrielle, and Kerouac. Your grandmother. My grandmother. And then sometime after he died, and she was down in Florida, just bedridden, being taken care of by Stella Sampas, somehow or other, this will appeared with 
Gabrielle leaving everything to Stella, which she would never have done in her right mind. And it's not even her signature, we found out. So I'm just looking into that, trying to find out what really happened. I thought that we treated Jan very generously and very well, even though she had been disinherited. And I had talked to Jan on the phone, and she had called me, and she had said she had gotten sick. I said, well, come on to Lowell. There's plenty of room here. We'll take care of you. And in a very nice voice, she declined. She said, well, I'm, I seem to be all right here. So that, that was the last, I think that was the last conversation I had with her. The next thing I knew, she was filing a lawsuit against the Snappers family saying that the, uh, her grandmother's will was forged. And I don't know where she got that idea from, other than her uh, people around her who had their own malicious intent here. There's really two sides. There's John Sampas saying he wants to sell it over 20 or 40 years. Why? So that he can make a lot more money than if he sold it right now. There's the other side supporting Jan Kerouac so that the family is, you know, treated well. But you see, nobody the cares about now. the Kerouac family. They only care about the Sampas family. Christ. <laughs> you know what I was thinking? What? A car right in the filming thing, we're driving out there. Oh, Some fucking God. guy nails us. You know, like kamikaze samples. Yeah. <laughs> right? No, I mean... He, said he wouldn't be kamikaze because he wants to enjoy all of his riches. <laughs> See, I'll do the kamikaze one of these days. I want you to understand that, you know, I'm very angry about the whole lawsuit. I'm extremely angry. Very angry. And, uh, it's going to take a long time for me to get over it. Because these people have, uh, libeled and slandered the Sampas family. trucks here. Yeah, they weigh trucks here. Right. Well, I don't want to be weighed particularly. Well, neither do I. Kanoko restaurants are horrible. Are they? Yes. So you mean this place is horrible? Well, the Kanoko restaurant All is bad. All this work is wasted. Oh, no. Oh, the restaurant is back there. That's just the sign. I've been coming to now, eat see, at look, the sign. Flying J Travel Plaza, Plaza. okay? Right. There's a little restaurant that I tried to get you to go to. Mm. Now that, we're in truck land. That is beyond us now because <laughs> we're in truck land. Oh, no. And, and oh, there was God. the Renegade restaurant across the street. Holy shit, look at this. Look at that purple. Yeah, we're, we're... How do we ever get out of here? Well, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. That's for sure. The country's changed because the highways are clogged. Like then it was, you could go from San Francisco to Denver to Chicago or whatever and hardly pass a few cars. It was very, very uh, sparsely uh, populated. Today, excess everywhere. Whether it's on the highway, whether it's listening, going to a record store, or buying a camera or a car. And the corporations are ruining, um, they're, they're raping the earth. Eventually the earth will be rendered uninhabitable by what the corporations are doing. And we'll all be extinct. They're just greedy for now. They don't care about the grandchildren or the progeny or the long line of the succession. They don't care about the kids that's to come. They just care about their bank accounts and how much money they can amass. Greed is just a mask for the devil. We all have a devil in us and it's greed is the devil. 
But you can't beat the devil. You can never beat the devil. But you've got to fight him, keep fighting him to keep him at bay. You've got to keep the devil at bay. Damn you rich lawyer sons of lawyer sons of bitches that rule our lives like Roman patricians. Damn you to hell with your sex gates, cocaine gates, zipper gates, Iran Contra gates, pumping out foreign policies between totes and strokes of pleasure. You're not America, just GM and Ford and IBM and trilateral commission lackeys dancing to the tune of magicians of darkness, hell bent on importing the flames of Hades to Earth's surface. In the names of the Vietnam dead, I curse you in these post-Frank Reynolds days. I curse you, Pentagon generals, at the controls of the video arcade of the world, thinking you can win, like kids win games of Pac-Man. You frigid, unemotional, computer prick assholes. I survived your Vietnam charade. I survived this black man survived to scream these curses at you. Washington is a town of morticians. Otherwise, why the big black limousines? All these years you've been showing us the end, riding in your funeral processions to and from white houses and cold marble tombs. You're not America, just big business and robber barons and La Costa Nostra evil polluting our amber waves of grain. I curse you with the juju of Africa, the juju of my ancestors who cursed your southern soil while plowing fields and chopping cotton under the bloody sun of American slavery. I curse you for the hardships of poor people everywhere while you spend trillion dollar budgets on weapons of destruction. I can barely afford to pay my rent and stuff, you know? Do you live in Eugene? Yes, I do. And I'm not complaining about not, you know, it being so tight, but... There was a big go around last year in June about the maple trees that they cut. Those maple trees were my friends. I used to walk through that parking lot all the time just to feel them. And they just ripped them out and didn't even care to put up a condominium development. It's like, wait a minute, no, we don't need that. That's the last thing we need. That is the last thing we need. We need more things that are gonna teach us to treat each other as brothers and sisters, to teach us to have love in our heart, to teach us to share. You know, if you told me you were hungry, even with that big camera and everything, I'd still do something to get you something to eat. You're my brother. Well, I am thirsty and I'm gonna get a drink, I think. How about down here at the little dairy mart? Sounds great. You okay. down there? Yeah, and well, you I'll can- I'll buy you a drink. I'll tell you what, man. Come behind the cart and let's see how it looks with the camera for you to be right. pushing the cart. Okay. Okay? Sure, you could just go over my shoulder. <laughs> Will that work? That's fine. Because, you know, I was telling my friend Chris, it would really do people that have lots of money and have worked at businesses and stuff and sit behind desks and stuff, it would really do them good to get a grocery cart like this and just put whatever in it and just get out here and push it. You know, because people look at you different. People look at you way different. I'm a good guy. You know, I have a real nice life. I have love in my heart and I have love for my brothers and sisters. Just because I'm pushing this cart don't make me a bomb. When Jan was alive, they kept saying she was rich. If she's so damn rich, why does she starve? Why does she live on two cans of insurance and a potato a day until the day she died? Because she couldn't afford food. And she was borrowing money to pay rent. Okay? This is the last picture I got of her. Look at this. Tell me she wasn't starving. Tell me she wasn't dying. And tell me the SOB didn't know. Okay, look at that. It looks like she's aged 20 years and a year. But you know what happened? I wasn't even aware of what she was entitled to or what she was not entitled to. As I say, I was new on board. So once the copyright lawyers got involved, they told me she shouldn't be getting foreign royalties. And at that point, why should I be financing her lawsuit against me? So I cut them off. So she's not supposed to be getting foreign royalties. And uh, technically, and from the legal point of view, she owed me that money that she had been getting, which we never recovered. The attempts by the Sampras family to cut down Jan Carr's income continued to the very end of her life. 
Any person needs money to stay alive, but to take money from a person on life support, such as kidney dialysis, is to seriously endanger that person's life. Jan needed expensive shots and periodic blood transfusions to stay alive. By February, Jan's financial situation had grown so desperate that she had to borrow money to pay her rent. She owed $25,000 to the IRS and an equal amount to her lawyer. Throughout her campaign to seize Jack Kerouac's estate, Jan was seriously ill. Her kidneys were failing, and she had inherited a rare blood disease from her father. She was able to maintain her, her body by doing dialysis and um, maintain her house, but I don't think that she was able to do much beyond that and it exhausted her to be a part of this lawsuit. Um, I don't believe that Jerry took that into account or ever led up. When I was down in San Francisco with Jan and Jerry, he was incredibly paranoid. Um, he, he said that he expected to be surprise attacked, gunned down. That sort of thing. I was asking uh, her if I could get just a, an audio dub so that I could have run it by my attorney to make sure if I said anything libelous, I might want you not to put that part in. Oh, that's well, right. I got send me an audio. Dirty okay. dub is fine. <laughs> we'll send you VHS of the whole thing one time. Okay. Too. Okay. So. And uh, yeah. I mean, you said nothing but libelous things, so it's okay. <laughs> well, no, because everyone I mean, else is saying know, libelous yeah. things about us. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's certain things if you recount something. So I guess it's open happened, season, right? So I've got an attorney. I'd rather you know, okay. just run it by him. Okay. I mean, for John so Sampras to, to say that I have no right to my father's okay. things, okay. How, how much more libelous <laughs> can you get? <laughs> That's such a surprise. You've got an unbelievable I'm memory. I'm daughter. Lenny, yeah. No, the beautiful daughter. I know. With the beautiful shoes. Second hand. She felt badgered by him, you know. I think she felt annoyed and exhausted by him. And I can totally see that, how that would be. That he, he tends to do his work, I think, with blinders on and then he sees his goal, whatever it is, but filters out whatever else he doesn't want to take in. Jan's campaign generated violent controversy in the beat community, and she was ostracized by many of her former friends. Her greatest loss was the support of her godfather, beat poet Allen Ginsberg, who predicted that if she filed suit against John Sampas, it would end in tragedy. Ginsburg died in 1997. When a person dies, it takes a while for their, their spirit to leave their body and all that kind of stuff. And then once that's happened, uh, you essentially are sending them on to wherever they're going with, by having a celebration. In the case of Alan, this is the photo that was burned before I glued the photo to the masonite. I impregnated the masonite with uh, this very high-tech high fire retardant. And then I soaked the photo in this fire retardant and then assembled the two pieces together and so on. So here's this photo. It, it isn't even brown in the, in the corners yet. Just sitting there flames and all the the unknowing uh partiers as as it were were like wow man this is like a message of some kind man look at that motherfuckers burn proof when it reached its point of combustion however it didn't just kind of fiddle around ginsburg just like exploded he went bah! And it was gone. Oh, here's Alan Ginsberg. Number 45 here, Michael Dean Odin Pollock. Come all the way from Iceland to be with all you here today and honor the memory of Alan Ginsberg, William Burroughs, Jack Kerouac, Arthur Rambeau, William Blake, 
and all the other countless artists and visionaries who've lit up this road for us. Poetry drums keep beating, sending signals out into the night, across the plains, piercing the skyscrapers, bouncing off mountains, valleys, canyons. Keep the poetry drums beating, the drums of Africa, drums of the North American Indian, keepers of the beat in a bar room in Chicago, in the hills of Morocco, in a rainy Central Park. Keep the poetry drums beating in the depths of the human heart. Keep the poetry drums beating. Yay! In 1995, Allen Ginsberg chaired a conference at New York University honoring the life and works of Jack Kerouac. Jan Kerouac was not invited. The last time I seen her in New York, I seen her up at the... Uh, it was like a theater, and they were doing a whole Kerouac thing up there, and they wouldn't let her in. She wasn't allowed in, so she was out picketing outside uh, with these guys with banners and all. I went up to town hall with Pat Fenton, who had done some articles on Kerouac, and he introduced me to Jan. And before I was introduced to her, he pointed her out to me, and I was maybe 10 feet from her, and she was in a circle of people. And they were demonstrating up at Town Hall because Jan was upset about the estate and the Sampas fights and all that kind of stuff. And she was protesting up there with Jerry Nicosia. At the very start of the conference, she wanted to ask um, uh, Allen Ginsberg for the right to speak uh, for five minutes to talk about the fact that two libraries, New York Public and Bancroft, were willing to pay a million dollars for her father's archive. Jan was told that she could not speak, and when, when Jan uh, insisted that she should have a right, that she, sh she was calling to Allen at, at one point to help her, and they, they simply said, uh, get the police and remove her. Waved and waving to take him out. They're irrelevant. He kept saying they're irrelevant. And I, I stood up and I, I just was very angry at that point and I started yelling, you can't take Jack Kerouac's daughter out of a Jack Kerouac conference. This is wrong, Alan. They're not irrelevant. And then, of course, they pointed a the finger at me, too, and they said, get rid of him, too. You are queen, mama, chastising unspoken for daughters with unutterances bursting from the seams. Seems as if I've written spanked patty children into corners after having isolated myself. Poorly lit Huddled. Too many years of breaking away ego until it became pretentious. And you send my poems back inside a self addressed stamped envelope with a rejection. The image you had of her when you saw her was a kind of a lost bird. You know, she was kind of slight, skinny, thin face, and hollowed out kind of eyes. I mean, she didn't look well, she looked ill. It was a tragic image I had of her. It's the only way I can describe it. I seen her one night up at, um, up at a poetry sort of reading. It was a party. Uh, NYU was having a big beat generation thing, uh, the university. And uh, this woman didn't know she was Jack Kerouac's daughter. And she was getting up to read that thing about the spice cake when they lived in Richmond Hill, Queens. And she was doing like a rap thing, <clears throat> bake me a spice cake, you know, ready to do this. And she said something, she was talking to a friend of hers and this woman said to her, keep quiet, we're trying to listen to this person talk about Vietnam. And she turned around and she said, fuck you, you bitch, I'm speaking next. Oh, 
Jan Kerouac died exactly one year after his so-called godfather, Allen Ginsberg, had her thrown out of the conference at NYU, held in the honor of her father. She was barred from speaking due to the fact she did an unauthorized lecture of her father the autumn before at the Kerouac conference in Lowell, Mass. Since when does a daughter need authorization to talk about her father? On June 5th, 1966, after having a lengthy operation to try to prolong her life so she could continue her fight to make her father's work available to the literary public, Jan's life support system was shut off by the powers that be after less than five hours. The powers that be claimed her last wish was to stop the case. Sorry, fuckers. That's a lie. This one's for Jan. Beloved Jan, you were the sister I always wanted, but you were taken away from me in youth by the dark, evil forces who tried to hide the truth, but none dare call it murder. No one held a gun to your head to decide to starve you instead, but none dare call it murder. Extorted, slandered, and robbed with legality and guile, they never could steal your smile, but none dare call it murder. And the felons walk in freedom as they steal your legacy, Yes, he'll walk in freedom, but he'll never be free. For none dare call it murder, but I do. next day, after she died, I talked to Debbie. And I said, Debbie, why did you pull the plug? Oh, 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 oh we couldn't afford, I mean, she was always bullshit excuses. And then she goes, her last thing she wanted to do before she went into the operation was to call you. She had your phone number, but some nurse spilled water all over it and she couldn't read the phone number. Jerry talked to the nurses. Nobody spilled any water on any damn phone numbers. They did not want me to talk to her. And I said, what about the case? Okay, and she said, oh yeah, they'll keep the case going. A few months later, she testifies that Jan's last wish was to stop the case. That's a lie. That is a damned lie. Poor Jan, uh, she was put under a great deal of strain when she was sick. I'm sure if she hadn't been put up to this, she'd probably still be alive. Not that she'd be in good health, but she, she would have enjoyed her life a lot more if she had not gotten involved in this, in this fraudulent lawsuit. Jerry and I went to a small memorial. It was, uh, it was on the way, it was on the way to that memorial that Jerry launched into it as well. If we win this lawsuit, if we win this lawsuit, oh, well, if we win this lawsuit, um, David, you could have a house in Marin County and all this other stuff, and, and he's just spouting off figures and spouting off figures, and it never left him, you know? He's like, he's, he, he didn't really strike me as a grieving man, you know? He just, he was always on, on his agenda. She felt that in some way she had been robbed of her father's family, she had been robbed of, of, of a paternal heritage, uh, some of it she couldn't help. She couldn't help the things that had been done to her by her father. Uh, she understood some of the reasons why her father couldn't be a father to her. But I think she felt that what was done to her by the Sampas family in taking away her father's writings, in disrespectfully treating her father's writings, was something that could be changed and helped. It was not excusable uh, that this was her heritage and that she wanted to reclaim that connection to her father. And that's why it was so important to her. There was a whole issue of justice of what her father wanted and her wanting to do the right thing by her father and, and create that connection with her father and forgive her father and love her father and show love to her father before she died. And I think that's what it was all about. And it was very, very deeply felt by her, uh, a sense of responsibility as Jack Kerouac's daughter to live up to that position of Jack Kerouac's daughter. Did you know your father really well? No. Mm -hmm. I only met him twice. Really? Yep. Yeah. It's so strange because everyone keeps writing for the father we never found and everything. And uh, and he's my father.
Jan showed Jack her hands. Big, masculine hands. Surprising. Jutting and clumsy from her slight, graceful body. Jan took Jack's hands in her own and said, You see? My mother said we have the same hands. And just then a road sparked in Jack's dumbstruck, oxen alcohol moron mind. Oh yeah. Gee, go to Mexico. Write a book. You can use my name. Those who live by the road shall die by the road. Typewriter fingers flailing pistons over the keys. 100 words a minute. 180 miles an hour. 100,000 light years of teletype paper. In three weeks, the Kerouac road book was done. The road became word and dwelt among us. Jack abandoned a daughter and father to generation. Then when that generation acknowledged him as their father, he tried to abandon them too. But they wouldn't have it. It was too late, Jack. The rut in the road is not the road. The rut in the road is the frozen road. The road not walked upon. The road not driven down. The life of road not moved upon. For fear of wind. For fear of rain. For fear of cold. For fear of darkness. For fear of speed. For fear of accident. For fear of thought, for fear of dreams, for fear of lust, for fear of love. The road is fearless, and the road is terrified. The road is overcoming fear of the road, pushing pedal to the metal till the wheels sing back. Humming rubber whirling at speed, the song says free. On concrete highways and tarmac streets and jet plane engines singing, soaring through endless clouded skies, among the stars, in tete-a-tetes and midnight bars, in the city at night, in the city at night, in the city at night. We try to do some things right now. Oh, okay. I, I, I thought, I'm the seventh wife. I know, but we, I'm we the don't seventh try to wife. You're the right seventh now. wife? Yes. Is that well, true? Well, them. We don't, don't believe everything you hear. <laughs> okay, I don't. It's true. No. It's very true, though. So, who are you? I'm um, like... wet weather. They call me wet weather. I'm from New Orleans. What are you doing here in San Francisco? Oh, I love San Francisco. I, I've been traveling all my life ever since the age of 17, you know, so this is where I wind up at. San Francisco. And you play the harp. I'm a harmonic player. That's what they say. <laughs> what do you say? I just leave it to them. I don't say anything. <laughs> okay, let's hear you play. Let them be the judge. All right. I'm back now. Yes, I'm back. I know I'm back now. Yes, I'm back now. Yes, I'm back now. Yes, I'm back. I know I'm back now. Yes, I'm back. I know I'm back now.
Kerouac wrote his last great novel in a small cabin at Big Sur on the Pacific coast. This was the end of my road. So we're down here, we're uh, doing a little home invasion action. Jerowack, the Jerowack, it's half Jack. That's Jack, Jack Kerouac in one word, Jerowack. <laughs> Why waste time? Exactly. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, are you Jack Kerouac? I am. What can I do for you? What are you doing here today, Jack? Well, I just gotta come down here and see if I could write a poem about what the ocean sounds like. We're great fans of yours. Well, thanks a lot. It means a lot to me. You've read all your books. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're, we're down here just to check out your cabin. Well, well, I don't know if I want to let you up to my cabin. Really? I have to get permission. From who? From John Sampas and Jerry Nicosia. Oh, no. Are you kidding? They That's own, they own they, the cabin. They own well? the cabin now. Oh, no. So I have problems with this, too. So I don't know if I can take company or not. I don't know if I'd welcome up there myself. Well... Maybe you could lead us the way. At least we could have a look, see if anybody's there. Well, first I gotta figure out how to forge this creek. We gotta get on the other side? We gotta get on the other well, side. Well, I don't know if that's right. Because... There's no sign of a trail. So it's just really beating it through heavy cut brush. Jack retreated to the cabin to reflect on what his life had become. He made daily walks along the riverside trail to the sea and began work on his novel, Big Sur. And there's a great moon. For three weeks, Jack was alone in nature. His only companion, an old donkey, he called Alf, the sacred burrow. We had probably made a quarter of a mile from where we turned up there. It's possible that there was no trail. Possibly there was. This being a work of fiction, there was no trail at all that Jack thought about going to the ocean. And it would have been nice if there had been a trail down there, so he put one there. But this way, if fools like us are trying to get in there, we, you know, we believe there's a trail, there's not a trail. You know, the joke's on us. I mean, this road looks like it comes down, this comes down from the high pass road. And Alf is dead, that's probably the problem. It's probably Alf's trail. Alf is dead, he, he used to eat his Alf way through Alf used to eat his way up and, and down this clean. sucker, that's right. No elf. No trail. No Jack. No Jack. Anyway, this book is in the public domain. We all own it. So we came down here this afternoon to take control of it. Mark Bender, Jim Stoffer, Jack Shea, Jan Kerouac, everyone in the world that owns a piece of this book. The public domain, it's a nice concept. Walk around, no more imposed self-agony. It's time to think and watch and keep concentrated on the fact that after all, this whole surface of the world as we know it now will be covered with the silt of a billion years in time. Nay, for this, more aloneness. Go back to childhood. Just eat apples and read your catechism. Sit on curbstones. The hell with the hot lights of Hollywood. And it's almost tearful to realize and remember the old green t-shirt I'd find, mind you, eight years ago, mind you, in the dump in Watsonville, California, mind you, and got fantastic use and comfort from it. It's the little things that count. On my deathbed, I could be remembering that creep day and forgetting the day MGM bought my book. I could be remembering the old lost green t-shirt and forgetting the sapphire robes. Maybe the best way to get into heaven. Listen to the goddamn words. That's right. And everybody's forgetting the words and paying attention to all this other shit. Who owns the words? This book doesn't belong to anybody. It belongs to everybody. And ultimately, all Jack will belong to everybody. It ultimately all matters nothing. Because it eventually goes to the public domain. And we'll all be dead. John Sampas, Jerry Nicosia, me, you. And the book will still be there.
Can I, I have like a 20 minute story to tell. Is that cool? No, no, no. All right, five, so I'm gonna, five minutes. Two minutes. All right, let me light my cigarette first. All right, listen up. I have an announcement to the country. If, if you guys ever see this, I'm writing a book, a novel, a novel about life. I've been through it all. I got kicked out of college, been through depression, manic depression. Um, I left my house Tuesday night. Today's Thursday, Tuesday night at one o'clock a.m. and drove to the Canadian border. I got kicked out of my house. I'm going to tour the entire country, United States, within two years, visiting every single state, chilling out for one month, collecting information on how people hang out. Look for my name, and I will let you know when I come to your state, because I want to see the people hang out and take a lot of pictures. If you ever see a kid in a white Nissan Sentra in 1992 taking pictures, cooperate, because you might be in my book. Seriously, no joke, I'm writing a novel. The book, unless this title has already been used, I'm not sure, it's going to be called my life in a nutshell but that sounds too good so it might be used but anyway that's it two minutes just tell the world baby i want to be noticed by the world so whoever sees this i love you baby see you later it's gonna take me three bazillion pages but i'm gonna have pictures on one side and then experiences on the next so it's gonna be a novel pictures story i think i'm not sure yet it's gonna take me a long time to write it folks but right now i'm gathering information so if you see me in your town or your state or anywhere Notice this face. See this face? I wear these sunglasses and my hair will be messed up because that's who I am. Smoking Parliament lights. Just be cooperative with me and you'll be in my book. That's all I got to say. Thank you very much, folks. I'm out of here. Show the world, baby. Show the world, baby. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Hey, okay, I want to know. I got to go to Vermont. How am I going <laughs> to okay. get there? You go to the city of Lemmiston. Okay. You pick up Miriam Avenue. Right. To the Kmart shopping center. Okay. There's traffic signals there. Get in the left-hand lane. Right. Get onto Route 2 West. Okay. Go Route 2 West all the way to 91. Right. Go north on 91 to hit 89. Okay. And take 89 all the way into Montpelier. Sounds good. <laughs> you got that? Think I'll make it? Don't get lost. I won't. If Bye. you get lost, call your mother. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Candios, okay. Jack.